The following is a CNN special report. From harsh beginnings to the heights of power, Vladimir Putin has ruled Russia for over a decade. They want a strong guy in charge. They've got a strong guy in charge. From the KGB to Sochi, a very public leader who remains a mystery to many. The power of Vladimir Putin. The International Olympic Committee has the honor. Since this announcement in 2007. The 22nd Olympic Winter Games in 2014 are awarded to the city of Sochi. Vladimir Putin has eagerly anticipated this moment. The Sochi 2014 Winter Olympics, a chance he told George Stephanopoulos to put Russia center stage. I want it to be a success for this nation. We are hosting these Olympics so that millions of sports fans the world over will feel this celebration. It won't be my personal success. That success will belong to this country, and I hope the success will come true. His Russia, his vision. And yet, the biggest showdown in Russia may not come on the slopes or on the ice. It may just be a war of wills between terrorists bent on violence and Vladimir Putin's complete commitment to safe and successful games. We will fiercely and consistently continue to fight against terrorists until their complete annihilation. It is Vladimir Putin's biggest moment yet on the world stage, one he vows will end in triumph and not tragedy. The most recent chapter in a life's journey that started here. St. Petersburg, Russia. Tsar Peter the Great's window to the west a city he created to pull Russia out of its medieval darkness. Putin lived in a one-room communal apartment with no hot water where he beat off rats with a stick. Now it's a tourist attraction. For Russians like this woman, it provides surprising insight into their president. It was a very ordinary person, very ordinary. And uh, he wants to go up very much, very much. The city of Putin's youth was called Leningrad. In World War II, the Nazis tried to starve the city into submission, a blockade that lasted 900 days. Thousands of the dead were hauled off to this memorial cemetery and buried anonymously in mass graves. Amidst nearly half a million people buried could be the brother of Vladimir Putin. The president has revealed that his brother, who was just a little boy at the time, died during the war, but he has no idea where that grave may lie. And this was the first one which... Strobe Talbot is an expert on Russia and has met with Putin several times. He learned as a child the brutality of life. And also because uh, of what the city of Leningrad and the citizens of Leningrad went through during the war, uh, what the enemies of Russia could do at their worst. And I think that has never left him. Putin was born in 1952. For him, it was a scrappy life, a thin boy, not very tall, who was constantly getting into trouble and always late for class. But this was his salvation. <laughs> Mikhail Rochlin is a judo master. His father, Anatoly, taught young Putin the sport. Judo has its own philosophy. It has power, technique, and tactical elements. 
Judo gave Putin focus, strength, and, says Strobe Talbot, the characteristic that most defines him. Discipline that he imposes on the people who work for him and on the country that he rules. Putin, a self-described hooligan, said the sport changed his life and taught him strategy. You wait the other guy out until it's hard for him. He steps back. You move forward. Then you win. As much as he loved judo, Putin loved spy movies like this one. At 16, Putin went to KGB headquarters intending to join, but officials told him he wasn't ready. They said, well, kid, go away. You need some education. He goes to law school, comes back, and he becomes an agent. I think he was very much a product uh, of that uh, quintessential Soviet uh, institution. I remember meeting him and having him lock his gaze uh, on, on my eyes and let me know that he knew a lot about my past. And what he was basically saying, I've studied your file. I know about you. We've got stuff on you. It was just classic KGB behavior. Putin was in his 20s and a KGB agent when he met Sergei Raldugin, an accomplished cellist, in the summer of 1977. We had a guitar and we were singing songs. We rode around town. He didn't look like a police officer, but he was just a good guy. Nothing else but a nice, charming guy. A nice, charming guy, lacking polish and driving a car like a tin can. That Zaporozhye's car had no muffler. You know what a muffler is? So it made this sound, you know? Putin's Zaporozhets wasn't sleek like this one from GoldenEye, and Putin was no James Bond. But he was plenty tough. One evening, a drunk student with a cigarette stopped Putin and asked for a light. Putin said, I won't give it to you. The student grabbed him, but the next moment I saw the guy's socks in the air. I don't know what technique he used. I just saw the guy's legs in the air. Somewhere under the brusque exterior was the discipline, the drive, that would one day pluck him from obscurity and land him here. Coming up, the Iron Curtain collapses, and with it, all of Putin's plans. In this unremarkable building, one of the Cold War's most feared agencies, the KGB. Secretive, powerful, and by the late 80s, Vladimir Putin's employer, although he wouldn't admit that he was a spy. He said he was in the special police. Sergei Raldugin is a friend. Putin Putin at that time never talked about his work. I was interested in the KGB, their intelligence officers. It was very romantic. And he immediately told me that in intelligence, the less they know about you, the better. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. It was the late 80s, the height of the Cold War. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Vladimir Putin was a mid-level KGB agent posted to East Germany with two young daughters and an attractive young wife, Ludmila, a former airline stewardess. The Soviet Union defined him, and not just the Soviet Union, but the security services, the KGB. Strobe Talbot is president of the Brookings Institution. He was part of the, not just the machinery, but in some ways the most characteristic Uh, piece of machinery and the most powerful piece of machinery uh, in the Soviet Union. The KGB was a powerful part of what some called the Ministry of Fear, and Putin was unflinchingly loyal both to the KGB and to the Soviet Union. 
So when the Berlin Wall was suddenly torn down, a desperate Putin phoned Moscow for instructions. But Moscow was silent. And the story goes, he was shocked. It's as if, you know, Moscow wasn't there. What was going on? Remember how surprised all of us were, kind of watching this structure that we thought was going to be with us for another generation at least, turned out to be so fragile, so vulnerable to internal pressures. That came as a great surprise to people like Putin, who were heavily invested in it. The Soviet system, and with it Putin's plans, were wobbling. In East Germany, Putin burned classified documents until the furnace exploded, then returned to the Soviet Union to chart a new course. I got the feeling the country no longer existed, he said. It had a disease without a cure, the paralysis of power. Putin returned to the Soviet Union, resigned from the KGB, and became the right-hand man to Leningrad's reformist mayor, Anatoly Sadchak. For me, he was just one of the men coming to, to the house to steal my father. That's it. Ksenia Sabchak is Anatoly's daughter and a Russian celebrity. She's known Putin since she was a little girl. Putin, she says, reads people like a book. And this is his big secret. So I think he knows how to speak with different kind of people, especially when he's alone with, him, with them. Perceptive and powerful, Putin used his skills to his advantage. His boss, the mayor Subchak, was uh, essentially a reformer and needed somebody who was sort of the tough guy behind the scenes to keep things under control. Keeping things under control and maintaining the Soviet system were important to Putin. But on Christmas Day 1991, when Vladimir Putin was 39, the world changed forever. I terminate my activities as president of the USSR. the Soviet Union ceased to exist. That system came crashing down because it depended on two things, the big lie and the iron fist. And the iron fist turned out to be not enough to keep it together. Leningrad became St. Petersburg again, and the reborn Russia emerged under this man, Boris Yeltsin. All Putin could do was keep his head down and work hard. Then, one day, the Kremlin noticed Putin's skills and called him to Moscow. He's had a very rapid rise through power in the bureaucracy. What explains that? I think it's a combination of genuine talent. He is not stupid by a long shot. He has clearly got a considerable intelligence, a lot of self-discipline, and he just knows how to play the system and to play personalities. Putin's meteoric rise through the ranks gave him increasing power and influence. He has also been someone whose goal has been to keep Russia in one piece and to elevate that Russia to a proper position in the world, which to him is uh, bring Russia back into the um, top league of global players. In December 1999, Putin had his chance to take charge. I resign. I did everything I could. I do it not because of my health, but for many other reasons. Boris Yeltsin shocked the world by stepping down and naming the unknown Vladimir Putin as his political heir. Dear Russians, dear countrymen, Today, I have been given the responsibility as head of state. Vladimir Putin was in control and would lead Russia for the next 14 years. Next, the Sochi Olympics. I mean, it's prestige. He is a big believer in prestige. And the shadow of terror. Fishing, 
tracking tigers, horseback riding, even hang gliding. Vladimir Putin presents himself as a symbol of Russian power and machismo. Strove Talbot remembers a tour Putin gave him through the Kremlin's private quarters. He showed off two things. One, the gym with his weights. And then we passed another room and he said, that was where the clinic was. Oh. In other words, that was where my predecessor spent a lot of time. The gym is where I'm spending a lot of time. And it's more than just a virile image. He's long been rumored to be in a relationship with a woman half his age. The Kremlin denies any affair. Nonetheless, in 2013, Putin divorced his wife, Lyudmila. Newly single, he hit the slopes in January 2014. But this time, it was not about his image. What is he trying to do with the Sochi Olympics? What's the message to the world? Russia is a great country. Russia is a modern country. Russia can hold an Olympics. You all come, but some of you aren't going to be as welcome as others, and the security's going to have to be very tight. I mean, it's, uh, it's prestige. Prestige, but not without controversy. At a cost of over $50 billion, it's the most expensive games in history. On ABC's This Week, Putin denied allegations of massive corruption. No, not true. Our law enforcement agencies have been working in this area. So far, we are not seeing any major, large-scale manifestations of corruption as part of the implementation of the Sochi project. But Putin can't deny the specter of terrorist violence, though he has vowed to prevent it. The job of the Olympics host is to ensure security of the participants in the Olympics and visitors. We will do whatever it takes. Putin's heavy hand has made him enemies worldwide, sparking controversy recently with a strong anti-gay stance. There have been protests against him. Yes, there's been a high degree of repression, but it's also interesting that there hasn't been a widespread, sustained support for the protests either. That's because Russians, Talbot says, are used to an authoritarian leader. Ksenia Sobchak is not so sure. We should fight with him not because he's a monster, he's not. Just his values are not my values and not values, I think, of the whole uh, you know, new generation in Russia. His mind is very, um, uh, so to say, Sovietic. Hmm. Soviet. Soviet. He's very, his mind is very Soviet. Talbot calls Putin a throwback. But Putin would call himself traditional, as he told me in this December press conference. We can need to find the most traditional values. Without these values, society becomes degraded. And quite clearly, we need to return to these values to understand the reason for this, the evaluations, appraisals of them, and to move forward. He tends to uh, pick on values that I think we could call sort of traditional uh, conservative values, his, uh, his anti-gay policies being a pretty good example of that. But what he's really saying is that we in Russia uh, are a pure civilization. Putin sees himself as the protector and savior of modern Russia. Over the last decade, Putin has paid off Russia's debt, improved the quality of life for many, and made Russia a major player in international affairs. He's also shown, just in the past six months or so, some dexterity in diplomacy, making a, a virtue out of the crisis uh, in Syria, sort of getting Russia back into the game of diplomacy in the Middle East and that kind of thing. And I think there is a certain accomplishment there. Yet, he has plenty of detractors. I don't want to compare, but Putin has his own truth, which is just different from ours. He's quite truthful in saying, like, look, I'm the ruler, it's my rules, I believe in these things, so I'm the president. So I would decide how you would live. 
Only time will tell whether today's Russians are willing to live by Putin's rules. But one thing seems clear. Putin doesn't plan to relinquish control anytime soon. Two presidential terms are not enough. Even four presidential terms are not enough. We're talking about a lifetime job. Even then, it will not be complete. So he wants to see it through.